Yeah. Uh, I did my lab work with you. So every quarter we do uh, we do blood work. Yes. And you do ex an extensive lab and look into all different areas of, of health. Yes. And I actually have a copy right here. Sure. So this is from. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I got it. Yep, that's from the last time that I was uh, that I went to see you. I came up came to see you last week for my follow up, and I just want to go over some of the the different things that you test. Yes. And uh, a little explanation because I think a lot of people are, are overwhelmed, especially guys like Chris who haven't been to the doctor in many years, Absolutely. and they're not sure, you know, what to expect. Yeah. There he is right there. And not really sure what to expect and what are all the different uh, levels here we're checking. So, uh, so the blood work is basically customized on every patient based on their medical condition. So when you come as a first time patient to me, uh, the blood work that's ordered is based on your medical conditions and your age, you know, and male or female, mm -hmm. you know. So that's it's not like yeah, there's no one size fits all. You know, one of the important things I provide that every patient is a different individual. Uh, you know, so that has always been my way of treating patients all through my career. Uh, interestingly, only in the last 10 years or less, they started in the whole medical field to talk about, you know, that every patient individualized plan of care. Right. But that's how it always should have been. I thank God that's how we always did it. So based on your conditions and the medications that you're taking, mm -hmm. that is how I order your blood work every three months. Plus minus if there's new issues or new complaints that we need to deal with. Understood. Yeah. Yes. So one thing that I'd mentioned earlier was the uh, the cholesterol issue I, I had. And, yes. And we have since resolved it. I still have a little bit of a, a low HDL, but but that's on me. I yes. need to eat more. It uh, fluctuates. You're you're doing well. Like uh, you know, your ratio between HDL to LDL was excellent in September. HDL dropped a little bit. Once you resume your focus on your exercise, once you improve your good oils like you know whether it's like avocado oil uh, extra virgin olive oil you know lower carbs lower saturated fat these are all simple things that you modify in your diet and lifestyle with the exercise and your hdl will bump up again what it was so key note there uh if you if you are suffering from low hdl healthy fats the avocado oil uh, extra virgin olive oil eliminating saturated fat increasing exercise these are all factors that would help improve the hdl Mediterranean diet, baby. That's exactly what it is, Mediterranean diet. <laughs> that's, that's how he's uh, in his 50s yeah. and looks like he's 40. The next topic here, estradiol. So most people associate uh, estrogen as a female, home, a predominantly female hormone, but um, explain the importance of why you would test a male for their uh, estrogen levels. Men, when they are on uh, testosterone replacement therapy, uh, it depends on their body fat. The higher the body fat, the more amount of testosterone breaks down into the female, uh, you know, uh, uh, hormone. This is through something called aromatase enzyme. So that's why, especially bodybuilders, if they're using very large amounts of testosterone, they'll have very high amounts of estradiol or estrogens in general. And that's why we either used to uh, uh, taking an aromatase inhibitor, like uh, an estrogen blocker. Of course, there's other estrogen blockers like tamoxifen. Those are direct receptor blockers. But the most common one for aromatization inhibitor is the, um, uh, anestrazole, and there's other ones. Uh, but again, we have to be realistic how we handle this. The average patient that's on testosterone replacement therapy, that's only taking around 200 milligram or less per week, yes, they will produce some estradiol that will vary from patient to patient, even sometimes very lean patients. They might be still producing more than what you, ex the, you would expect as a physician. The key thing, we don't like to touch and lower that estradiol unless it's causing symptoms. So what are the symptoms? If a patient tell me they're having like soreness and severe pain in their nipple and they have a little lump behind their nipple, it's called gynecomastia. So then we will put them temporarily on an estrazole or another aromatization inhibitor to slow down that estrogen until after a few months, their body will adapt and they may not need to stay on it like long. Uh, so this is very important because one of the biggest mistakes that happens in the hormone replacement clinics is putting every man on an estrazole. Actually, this is not necessarily the best thing because if we go back and we think about prostate and prostate cancer, etc., estrogen is one of the things that were used in the past in treating prostate cancer. If mm -hmm. we search the literature and we do Google search for the words, you know, you know, estrogen and apoptosis on prostate cancer cells, apoptosis meaning death of the cell, you'll find that estradiol and estrogen have an effect killing the prostate cancer cells. 
So I don't know how safe it is to just block every man as estrogen trying to make it undetectable, thinking we're doing them a big favor. No, only if they have symptoms. So the symptoms in general is the breast pain, the breast enlargement. A lot of people will be confused saying, oh, my estrogen is high, I feel emotional. No, 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 it's not that simple. It's not like if we have a little estrogen, then we feel emotional and we blame women on being emotional because they have estrogen. That is not the case. This is like uh, not accurate information or accurate medical information. I've treated thousands of men, you know, for hormone replacement therapy. I treat a lot of, a good percentage of those, not a very high percent, were bodybuilders, professional athletes who were using testosterone in their own way. And I had to manage their testosterone in the presence of high amounts with their estradiol. A lot of doctors, their stance on this, they'll just tell the bodybuilder, no, 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 you have to stop immediately. You're going to die. Uh, you know what? When I was young, I did what these people did when I was watching the people who were teaching. But then at some point I realized that, well, somebody, is his career is bodybuilding. He's going to do it with me or without me. So I have one of two options as a doctor. Either learn and understand everything that has to do with your hormones, testosterone, estrogen, encyclopedia of anabolic steroids, and understand the language that these people talk so I can protect them, I can guide them or have the usual stance in the medical field, like every endocrinologist will tell them, stop this immediately, you're gonna die. Well, they're gonna do whatever they wanna do. So you'd rather save them and give them guidance if you can, and they're willing to listen mm -hmm. if somebody's educated guiding them, versus letting them do whatever they do, and then yes, you'll hear a bodybuilder die every once in a while, sudden death, you know, from whatever. Instead of letting them make their own medical decisions, you're try gonna, to help them. You're gonna, you're and gonna help them and analyze their lab work and try to- Correct. Do and, it as safely as possible. And whatever they decided to mix of steroids, you have to explain to them, you can't mix this with this, this with that because of this. So at least try to keep them safe. And at the same time, they're going to achieve their goals.